Joshua chapter 7, verses 1 through 12. It says, But the children of Israel <clears throat> committed a trespass in the accursed thing. For Achan, the son of Carmi, the son of Zabdi, the son of Zerah, of the tribe of Judah, took of the accursed thing, and the anger of the Lord was kindled against the children of Israel. And Joshua sent men from Jericho to Ai, which is beside Beth Haven, on the east side of Bethel, and spoke unto them, saying, Go up and view the country. And the men went up and viewed Ai. And they returned to Joshua and said unto him, Let not all the people go up, but let about two or three thousand men go up and smite Ai, and make not all the people to labor there. For they are but a few. So there went up, so there went up there of the people about three thousand men, and they fled before the men of Ai. And the men of Ai smote them about thirty and six men. They chased them from before the gate, even unto Shebarim, and smote them in the going down, wherefore the hearts of the people melted and became as water. And Joshua rent his clothes and fell to the earth upon his face before the ark of the Lord until the eventide. He and the elders of Israel and put dust upon their heads. And Joshua said, Alas, O Lord God, wherefore hast thou at all brought this people over Jordan to deliver us into the hand of the Amorites, to destroy us? Would to God we had been content and dwelt on the other side, Jordan. O oh Lord, what shall I say when Israel turneth their backs before their enemies? For the Canaanites and all the inhabitants of the land shall hear of it and shall environ around us and cut off our name from the earth. And what wilt thou do unto thy great name? And the Lord said unto Joshua, Get thee up. Wherefore liest thou thus upon thy face? Israel has sinned, and they have also transgressed my covenant, which I commanded them. For they have even taken of the accursed thing, and have also stolen and dissembled also. And they have put it even among their own stuff. Therefore the children of Israel could not stand before their enemies, but turned their backs before their enemies, because they were accursed. Neither will I be with you anymore, except you destroy the accursed from among you. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray that you'd be with me, Lord, that you'd use me as a vessel through, with your, through which your word would flow, Lord God. Allow it to flow like a river, Lord God. Allow it to flow out of me and into your people, Lord. Let it speak forth what you desire it to speak, Lord God. We give you liberty and freedom in this yes, service, Lord. Lord. We, don't, we, we cannot just go according to a plan, but instead we give you liberty to say what you desire to be said this morning. Lord, I pray that you'd move Matt out the way, move Matt's flesh out the way. Lord God, because it only gets in the way, Lord. What we need is for you to speak, Lord God. Your people need to hear a word from the living God. And so we pray that you would speak to us this morning, Lord, no matter whether it be harsh or soft. Yes, Lord. Whether it be correction or encouragement. Lord, you let it flow the way you desire for it to flow this morning, Lord. And have your way in Jesus' name. I didn't really title this morning's message, but I think if I did, it's really the first point. I would call it the hidden thing. You know, one other thing about this story that I didn't read to you is that when it's all said and done, that they took the hidden thing, and what he did was he brought it inside of his tent. His name was Achan, and he buried it in the ground in, it, in his tent, and it was hidden. But you see, the Lord knew what had taken place, and this great defeat had happened. So in my opinion, personally, AI is one of the worst defeats the people of God that has ever been described in the Bible. There's so many factors in this ancient story that, in my opinion, uh, also mirror the lives of modern Christianity today. So when we read this story, essentially what we just read was, is that the children of Israel went to view the land, they spied it out, they went to this place called Ai, which means a heap of ruins, by the way. They went to go spy out this land, and what they found was is that it just looked like it was real small. It, it wasn't much of a battle at all, and I'm going about to talk to you about the previous victory that they just experienced, and after a big old victory like that, this just looked so small. It's like, man, we're going to go in here, we're just going to wipe up, the, you know, we're going to wipe this people out, and this is no problem. No, we don't need the whole army to go, we just need to send a few men, and we see that really what took place was a great defeat 
happened in their life. And many times, I hate to say it, but I believe that this does, it mirrors much of modern day Christianity. So the word AI means a heap of ruins. When it's all said and done, the enemy wants to lure you into a trap and he ultimately wants to destroy you and he wants to leave your life a heap of ruins. I believe that with all my heart. If you've been serving the Lord for any length of time, you ought to also be convinced of the fact that the enemy of your soul is never going to be pleased with just leaving things copacetic, if you will, leaving things the way that they are. No, he's constantly going to try to be turning you into a a heap of ruins. I see in this verse four, defeat and retreat. They went up there, the people, about 3,000 men, and they fled before the men of Ai. It's a bad thing whenever we find ourselves running in fear from the enemy, whenever we find ourselves beaten down, whenever we find our, you know, we, we don't, we get to a place where it's difficult for us to really trust the Lord. We get confused in our walk with God. We don't, we don't believe that he has the power to truly deliver us anymore because what we've been seeing for so long in our life is defeat. But I'm here to tell you, that's not God's plan, nor is it his will. Instead, he wants to give victory. Sometimes we even start to wonder whether we would have been better, better off settling on the other side of the Jordan. You remember that out of verse 7? Joshua said, Alas, O Lord God, wherefore have you brought us this people over Jordan to deliver us into the hand of the Amorites to destroy us? Would to God. In other words, I wish to God that we would have just been content to dwell on the other side of the Jordan. Failure and fear, and it results in a bad name on God. It results in the people of God, you know, running from the enemy. For the Canaanites, verse 9, and all the inhabitants of the land shall hear of it. You know, whenever you and I fail the Lord, I'm not here to bring condemnation this morning. The Lord knows every last one of us in this place have failed God, even after we've known God. Come on, if we're real with one another, we have to shake our head and we have to admit from our heart that we have let the Lord, we might have let the Lord down last night for all we know. But the reality of it is, is this, is that the enemy wants to set you on the run whenever you fail. He wants to make you think that you're, it's impossible for you to win. And I'm here to tell you this, this morning that that is not what the word of God says. But when we do fail, let us let us understand that when we do fail and it's broadcast for all the world to know, it brings it defames the name of the God that we serve. It is very important that we get a revelation of that because surely somewhere in our hearts when we realize how much God loves us and all that he's done for us, it should give us a desire to not fail the Lord. You're not going to do it in your own strength, brothers and sisters. I'm here to tell you, don't worry. Before we leave, we're going to talk about victory and how victory comes. But at the same time, we need to understand that it's not just about us. Sometimes we're so driven by our flesh. We want what we want so bad that we don't even think about the name of the Lord. Amen. Lord, help us. Help us, Lord. When that happens, it says that, that we shall be environed around, encompassed around by our enemy, surrounded to the point where our name would be cut off from the earth. You know, if the, if the enemy would have his way, he would cut the name of Christianity off from the earth. You know why? Because true believers represent the God of heaven. Yeah. How else are they going to know? Your presence here and the word of God still on this earth is a constant reminder. And I, I'm going to tell you a thorn in the side of the world. It's a thorn in the side of the spirit of Antichrist. The plan of the spirit of Antichrist through the world is to convince the world that God isn't real. But every time you allow the glory of God to resonate out of your life, to, to be exposed out of your life, it's a reminder to the world and the enemy that God is real. Amen. That he has a people on this earth Amen. and that his word continues to do Hallelujah. what he said it was going to do. He said, what will it do unto your great name if your people from this earth it'll make you it'll make God look bad last thing they said God said no get up off the ground because the the children of Israel have taken of the accursed thing and you know what they did they brought it amongst their own stuff how many times did the, does the church bring the world into its walls how many times and I'm telling you it's pre, it's so prevalent in the church today so prevalent in the church today. We mix psychology with the word of God. 
And, and, you know, we, we mix the, 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 the plans of psychology with the counseling of the world. And we mix all of these different ideas and programs that man has come up with. And we intermix it and intertwine it with the word of God. And then what we do is we put a label on. We say, hey, this is the Lord. This is now how the Lord is moving. We have all these new plans and all these new things that mankind has come up with. And we just paint with a little bit of scripture. And then we call it of the Lord. But no, it's not of the Lord. Man's ways are not of the Lord. God has a way and it's the way that he wants us to go is through his son. And let me tell you something. There is true freedom and liberty in that. And if I'm a man that I am a man that uses too many words sometimes. But if you, if you don't get anything this morning, please understand this. God has a way. And the way is through his son. And it's not mixing man's ways with God's ways and calling it God. That's not how God works. That is not how God operates. It never has been, nor will it ever be. Instead, mankind takes the things of the world and he wants to dress them up and he wants to present them and say, now this is the Lord, but that is a ploy of the enemy. That is a ploy of the enemy to dress up the things of the world and to say that they're the things of God. And then now he's bringing you down a different pathway that appears to be a good pathway, but it's a pathway that's moving you in an opposite direction of the pathway to God because there's only one pathway to God and it's through his son, Jesus Christ. And it's going to always remind you that you care. You are not good enough in and of yourself. Here, you and I are not good enough in and of ourselves, but that is Jesus who died for us and set us free. The real reason that AI is such a tragic defeat is because it takes place right after the victory God gave his people in Jericho. Physically, Jericho was a city protected by a wall that would have been impenetrable by the most power of, powerful of nations. But to Israel, it served as an obstacle in the way of the promises of God. The crossing of the Red Sea, when we look at it typologically or however you want to describe it, represents our salvation in Christ. What I mean is, is that on the Passover, the word of God tells us that they took a lamb, they, they collected it, they cut its throat, they collected its blood, they painted the doorpost and the side post with blood. God said, when I see the blood, I will pass over you. Jesus was crucified on the Passover night. Jesus is the fulfillment of the Passover. What, what is the fulfillment of the Passover? He was the lamb that was slain before the foundation of the earth. He's the one that died in place of the guilty so that judgment could be passed over the people of God. So when you accepted Christ, if you have, what does it mean to accept Christ? It means to believe what the word of God says that first you're a sinner. Not that you got a sickness, but that you're a sinner. If you have a sickness, it's because of sin. You were born like your father, Adam. Listen to me. I, I was in three rehabs by the time I was 19. And you know what they kept telling me? They kept telling me, well, you received this sickness from your dad. Jim was an alcoholic and you received the sickness from No, that's a lie from the pit of hell. Yeah, I received something from my daddy. It's called unsavory DNA, but he got it from his daddy before him, his daddy before him, his daddy before him, his daddy before him, all the way back to Adam, who was the original old man, who was originally a new man, created from the, from the dirt of the earth, the pneuma or breath of God, breathed into him. He was without sin, but then he sinned. And now all the offspring of Adam from that day moving forward have been born in the image and likeness, not of Jim Abair, but in the image and likeness of Adam. The reason that you might have a problem with addiction, and listen, those out there that don't have a problem with addiction, they just think you're so poor and pitiful because you got an addiction. You need to learn how to stand up and allow the God of glory to set you free because, listen to me, they might think that you're all poor and pitiful, but they're poor and pitiful in their own selves. They just got a, di a different sin of a different flavor, a different addiction of a different flavor. They just think that they're so high and mighty with their self-righteous sin. Half the time it's the people in the church that are so bad off. Yeah. We won't even go there right now. I'm just trying to make a point that the Red Sea, deliverance through the Red Sea, the Passover lamb, the shedding of blood represents your salvation. Represents the fact that God delivered you out from under Pharaoh's bondage. He delivered you out of Egypt, which is the world. <laughs> The God that you served saved you by sending his son to shed his blood to deliver you out from the bondage of Egypt so that you wouldn't have to live as a slave there anymore. Does that sound familiar? 
You ever been a slave to sin? You ever felt like you wanted to worship the Lord, but yet at the same time, how many times are you, you even worshiping the Lord, raising your hands to God, and now all these crazy thoughts enter into your mind, crazy thoughts of lustful things and desires to do ungodly things that try to stand between you and the God of Israel, the God that loved you enough to save you. No, the Lord wants to set you free. Amen. He told Pharaoh, you let my people go so that they might come and worship me. The Lord wants his people to be set free and, and walk in freedom and liberty so that they can worship him. Why? So that they can give him glory. Yes. Not just, yes, he wants you free, but he wants you free for a purpose so that you can be in, his, in your life. He can be exalted. Yes. Yes. Is the world going to always accept that? No, they're not. Is the church always going to accept that? No, they're not. As a matter of fact, more times than not, they're going to want you to be only reminded about what you used to be. They're going to want to try to keep you clothed in Adam. But I'm here to tell you, you're not clothed in Adam if you're born again Christian this morning. You're clothed in Christ. Yeah. But first, you're going to have to know it to begin with. But then you're going to have to learn how to walk in it. And that's really what I want to talk to you about this morning. I want to talk to you that just because, and listen, we got a different mixed crowd here this morning. Some people maybe understand a whole lot about what I'm going to talk about. Some people maybe a little bit less. Some people maybe don't really understand a whole lot about what I'm going to talk about. But I'm going to do my best to make it clear. I'm here to tell you, though, this. Whenever you first get a revelation of what the Lord really wants for you out of the Word of God. And some of you know what I'm talking about. When you start to really get a revelation of how victory works. Sometimes we, be good, we, we can get so puffed up so fast. Mm. Oh, I got it now. I'm ready to move on. Hold on a second. Slow down. Tap the brakes. Downshift a little bit. Because when you get a revelation, now you got to start learning how to apply that in your life yeah. each and every day in all kinds of untoward circumstances. Amen. Because listen to me, the old man that you used to be that used to walk a certain way whether whenever you were in the world and you did drugs and alcohol or, you know, every time I get frustrated, even as a Christian, I always it was it was always a chain of events. Something got me mad. Something got me frustrated. You make fun of it if you want. First thing you know, I'd stick a dip in my lip. Next thing you know, I'd have a cord in my hand. Next thing you know, it'd be something else upon something else and then a fall and then condemnation and then guilt. That was the old man. Every time something went wrong, that's what I went to. The behavior of the old man. Yeah. Day after day, yeah. year after year, for so long I was being conformed into the image of Adam. Mm -hmm. Learning how to operate like Adam. Learning how my flesh wanted certain things. And yielding to my flesh. And now becoming very easy for me to yield to the flesh. Yeah. But now, new creation in Christ, the old man dying in Christ, Romans chapter 6, being buried in Christ, being resurrected to newness of life, a new creation, all things have passed away, all things have become new. Now, with the breath of God, the Spirit of God living on the inside of me, Him telling me how to move forward in the things of God. But now i got to learn this new life. And it's not as easy as what we entertain it to be. No, it's not easy at all. Because let me tell you something. I'm about to get into it. I'm a little bit ahead of myself already. But when you cross over Jordan, if you think you left all your flesh on the other side, you are wrong. If you think you left your sin nature on the other side, you are wrong. And the enemy of your soul will still tempt you in so many different ways. And he's so much slicker than what we've ever given him credit for. I'm here to tell you, he wants to turn you into a heap of ruins. He wants to leave you as a pile of rubble. He wants to destroy your life so that when he destroys your life, he will then turn around and cause people to laugh at your God. But I'm here to tell you, God's about taking heaps of ruins and he's about turning them into beauty. Amen. He turns ashes into beauty. He's a God of resurrection. He makes dead things live. Yeah. Hallelujah. But just like the children of Israel, they were delivered out of Egypt. And then you know what happened? What happened next? The wilderness. A wandering around in a wilderness. Falling and failing. Day after day. You know, the book of Deuteronomy, it's not really in my notes, but he said, I'm the one that led you in that wilderness those 40 years. Why'd you leave me in the wilderness, God? To show you your heart. He said it in Deuteronomy to prove to you your heart. Because there were things in you that you couldn't even see. Oh, you thought, there were things. I don't know if, it was, if this happened to you, but when I got saved, I became so self-righteous so fast. I'm just telling you. 
One week I'm in a bar room, like trying to talk to three different girls. And the next week I'm writing a letter to my sister and telling her fornicators and drunkards are going to hell. How fast did I just become so self-righteous thinking that I had so much figured out? But listen to me, whenever we're walking in this wilderness, the Lord wants us to come to a place. But many times we're unwilling to come to a place where we will really see self. That's another big part of my message this morning. The Lord wants you to see self. He wants you to see who you really are so that you can look towards who he really is. So that he can turn, that you can turn around and yield to him and allow him to have his way in your life. But just like Israel in the wilderness, we falling and failing and complaining and looking backwards at Egypt. Boy, this is good right here. Not because I said it, but this is good. Looking backwards at Egypt. What is Egypt? Your past. The world that the Lord delivered you from. Again, how did he deliver you? He delivered Israel out of Egypt through the shedding of a, the lamb, a lamb's blood. He delivered you out of Egypt through the shedding of Jesus' blood. But here they're walking around in the wilderness and they're looking back at Egypt and they're like, oh, why did we come out here? I remember the garlic and the leeks and the onions and the melons. It was so good back in Egypt. Why are we here with this old nasty manna that God gives us every day? It's the same old thing. How boring is it to live for God in the middle of a wilderness? And all we got is this manna. Oh, that melon was so good when that juice came running down my mouth. Oh, those onions just added so much flavor to that gumbo. I wish I could go back to Egypt to get me another bite of that stuff. It was oh so good. That's a lie. It wasn't good. No, you forgot about the bondage. All you remembered was the good things whenever you... Lord, forgive me. Whenever your toes were curled up because your flesh felt so good. Whatever it was that made your toes curl. I'm just saying. I'm being real with you this morning. It's all you remember is the good times. It's all you remember is the titillation of your flesh. Scintillation, whatever the word is. Scintillating. Oh, Lord, Egypt was so good. Let me go back to Egypt. No, that's a lie. And then God said, it's time to cross the Jordan. It's time for you to forget the past and what's behind you and look forward to the promises I have in front of you. In order for the believer to walk into victory and promises of God, the victory of Jericho has to become the new pathway. On this path, the Lord and his power is in front and the victory is secure. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about Jericho before we move forward. But I got to tell you, that's the main idea here. That on this path of the victory of Jericho, the Lord and his power is in the front of the believer. And then the victory is secure. See, once the people of God cross the Jordan, everything looks so different in the new land. If you never crossed Jordan before, what does Jordan represent? Well, if, if Passover represents Jesus dying on the cross, crossing the Red Sea represents us believing that God's delivered us and that's our salvation. Crossing over Jordan describes me leaving my old life behind, realizing that Egypt was a lie and moving forward towards the things of God. It means for me personally, you know what it meant? You know what Jordan was for me? For me personally? I received a revelation of the fact that though I was born a slave of sin in Adam, I was born again to a new life in Christ. I began to learn that it wasn't me and my performance that would win the day. Oh, listen to me. Uh, I could sit here and I could be so specific about this in so many different ways that we look at our own performance That we look at how much we quote scripture. That we look at how much we spend time in prayer. That we look at how much we go to church. That we look at how much we pray in the spirit. That we look look at I'm going to work this. I'm going to do this. And when I do this, then God's going to do this. God's asking one thing from you. And what he's asking from you is that you will believe him at his word. And his word says that man was so corrupt that he had to send his only begotten son to hang on a criminal's cross. To pay a penalty for sin so that you could be liberated and set free. What I want you to know is, is that when the people of cross Jordan, everything looks different in the new land. I began to learn that it wasn't me and my performance that would win the day, but I had to learn to surrender my will to God. I had to learn to surrender my power 
and move out of the way by putting the presence of God before me and before the desires of my own heart. Suddenly, I began to experience victory. I'm just telling you about my little story right now. I began to experience victory, and it was as though the first stronghold of my life, let's call it Jericho. Does it really matter what it really was in, in my life? I'm talking about the sin that so easily besets us. I'm talking about to you, whoever you are, sitting there in that chair. There should be something that pops into your mind that reminds you that it was a constant stumbling block in your life. May even still be a constant stumbling block even today. But I'm here to tell you that God wants to allow a Jericho victory to take place in that part of your life. I began to experience victory. We'll call it Jericho. It came crashing down. And I realized it was so different. I've shared this with people before. It was so different because in times past, it was like if you could imagine sin being like fruit on a fruit tree. And all the work that is required in order to pick fruit off a, fu a fruit tree. And all the work and all the ways that I tried to allow myself to try to get God to work in my life to set me free. And then all of a sudden. It was like the fruit just started falling off. I'm talking about the fruit right now being like sin. Just started to fall into the wayside. Started just falling off because yeah. the presence of God was doing the work and it wasn't me trying to work it anymore. Instead, I was learning how to walk and to allow God to walk before me. What I described is that same way that God gave victory to Israel over Jericho. Look at Joshua chapter 6 verses 3 through 4. It says, and you shall compass or walk around the city, all you men of war, and go around about the city once. And this shall you do for six days. And seven priests shall bear the ark, seven trumpets of ram's horns. And the seventh day you shall compass the city or go around it seven times. And the priests shall blow with the trumpet. Six is the number of man and nothing happened the first six times they walked around because spiritual victory doesn't come through what man does. Right. Spiritual victory does not come through what man says. Amen. You can't win spiritual battles when you're operating in the flesh. That's why psychology mixed with theology doesn't work. Amen. That's why man's plans painting it with scripture and trying to say it's God doesn't work. Because it's created by man, it's created by his flesh, and he's trying to endorse God's stamp on it. And God said, but that was never my plan. Man created that. Now you're put, trying to put my name on it. Just because you put my name on it doesn't make it mine. Nope. You can't win spiritual battles if you're operating in the flesh. But on the seventh day, the day that represents us learning how to rest in his work. Yes, on the seventh day, God rested from his work. But the word of God teaches us that there's a Sabbath for the people of God to enter into. A rest for the people of God to enter into. And it wasn't the rest of just entering into the promised land. We know that from the psalmist. I'm not going there. But what I will tell you is this, is that there was another rest for the people of God to enter into. Because it's not about just a Sunday. Some preachers are trying to make their people feel guilty. Say, well, if you don't partake of the Sabbath, well, let me take it, let me break it down even big, bigger for you. Seventh day Adventists will tell you if you don't go to church on Saturday, then you're really outside of the will of God. I'm just telling you the truth. Then most preachers will tell you if you forsake the gathering of the brethren and you don't come to church on Sunday, you're not in the rest of God. No, the rest of God is not a day. The rest of God is a man. When, you're, when you allow yourself to submit and rest in the man Christ Jesus, who is the fulfillment of the rest of God, come unto me, you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. When you learn to rest in Christ, guess what happens? All of a sudden, you want to be in the house of God because you want to be around the people of God because you want to experience the joy of God and the spirit of God in your life. Amen. Seventh day represents us learning how to rest in his work on that day. Seven, the seven priests with seven trumpets and the ark. I want you to get a picture of this. The ark of God. Because we see what my message is about is that you and I are learning how to allow the presence of God to go before us. Not me in front. 
saying, okay, Lord, I got this for a while. You just take a seat in the back seat while I'm going to put you on the back burner and I'm going to go ahead and move forward with my plans and my will. And then when I'm ready, I'll let you jump in, you know. <laughs> you ever seen people whenever they're driving down the road and no boy got a, you got a, he done lost his license. He done got himself in trouble and he's over there driving and, you know, he might even be intoxicated or something. And he goes up there all of a sudden, it's like, oh Lord, we got, we got a switch. Man, we got to try to try to do a switch right there in the middle of the road while you're driving down the road. That ain't gonna work. I have seen it. Can't put God in the back seat and then all of a sudden, whenever things aren't going right, you want to try to put him up in the front seat, let him drive. No, that's what I'm trying to talk to you about this morning. Allowing the Lord and the Spirit of God to go before you. So, I want you to get this picture: big old city, Jericho. Big old walls, huge walls. No nation can destroy this city. These walls are impenetrable. It represents the obstacle for the child of God to move on into the new land across the Jordan to receive the promises of God. But this is what you call a stronghold in the life. Jericho was a stronghold in Israel's life, preventing them from moving forward. What has been the stronghold in the midst of your life that has prevented you from moving forward with God? I'm here to tell you on the seventh day when the seven priests blew the trumpets and with the shout of the people of God the walls the Bible says came crashing down and they just walked in and they took the victory and that's what God wants to do in your life but the presence of the Lord was before them the whole time they were walking what are you talking about preacher the ark of God that little golden box that contained the Ten Commandments and had that cover on top of it called the Mercy Seat, where the two cherubim, golden angels, faced and looked down towards the Mercy Seat because once a year that place, it represented judgment because the law was in there and the law was broken. And you and I have broken the law because we've all sinned against God. We're all in the same boat. Some people are like, I don't like that preacher. He talks too much about sin. The Bible talks about sin. The Bible says sin is the problem that we have. Sin stands in between you and I and a holy God. And whenever we get sin out of the way, God wants to rush in. And the only way sin can be brought out of the way is through the shedding of that blood that once a year on the Day of Atonement would be placed. On that mercy seat. The ark of God represents Jesus' sacrifice. And even more beautiful. If it could get any more beautiful. It represents the fact that God's presence. Has been brought back close to his people. Because of the Jesus of Jesus' sacrifice. Because of the blood. He said when I see the blood again. He said it in Passover. When I see the blood I will pass over you. He says when I see the blood. My presence will dwell with my people. Between the cherubim. This ark represents represents the presence of God and the people of God. This story represents the people of God allowing the presence of God to go before them, putting the Lord in the driver's seat, putting God in front, realizing that I'm incapable. The greatest strength that I've ever found was when I finally fell to my knees and realized I can't do it. All my life I was taught, boy, you can do whatever you think you need to do. Pull yourself up by the bootstrap. Get out there and get it done. I wish I could tell him again. I'd tell him, and I know I've said it before, no, Daddy, I can't pull myself up by the bootstraps in this one. I can't beat this one in my own strength. I can't do this on my own. I need the Lord. I have to become dependent upon God. Hallelujah. They can look at me as though I'm weak. Let them look at me as though I'm a fool for Christ. But I'm here to tell you, I have found great strength in learning weakness and humility by surrendering to the will of God. Teach me your will, Lord. Keep me broken in your presence. Remind me that I'm not all that I think I am. Remind me that your word says, don't think more highly of thyself as what you ought to. No, you need to humble yourself. If you're going to be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ, you're going to realize you ain't all you think you are. But that instead, he is everything that the word of God says that he is. I must decrease so that he might increase. Who do I think I am? I'm going to figure it out and fix it for the Lord. No. God doesn't need a fixer. He's the fixer. He needs us to humble ourselves and to surrender to his will. Allow his awesome power to move in us so that he can move through us. That's what he wants to do, church. He wants to do a work in us so that he can do a work through us. He wants to allow his name to be glorified upon this earth. He wants to do something spiritual and miraculous. 
He wants to do a process in your life where he changes you, where the old man born of Adam dies and a new man born again in Christ begins to live, learning how to apply the truth of God every day. Listen, man, whenever you get free from addiction, that's just the first step. Right. I know I talk about this a lot, but now you got all these personality quirks. You think God's cool with that? You think God's cool with Matt being rude to people? Come on, man. You think God is really cool with Matt? Oh, Jesus this, Jesus that, Jesus this, and then next thing you know, it's like, rude? <laughs> really? No, he ain't cool with that. Not, not even that much. As a matter of fact, it disgraces his name. You think, you think the Father's cool with the fact that Jesus was obedient even unto death and allowed them to slap his face and pluck his beard and blindfold him and hit him on the head, thrust the crown of thorns on his head, hit him with a stick, slap him, pull the beard out of his face and say, prophesy, son of man, who it is that striketh thee. You think God's okay with the fact that Jesus humbled himself and allowed all that to happen only to bring glory to God and that we're going to turn around and we're going to allow our flesh to be elevated and pride to take over and for me to exalt myself and put myself in front of the presence of God instead of humbling myself and lowering myself? No, God's not okay with that. I'm preaching to the preacher this morning. God wants us to lower ourselves and to humble ourselves and to allow the Lord to be in front. <coughs> I want you to know something that, you know, receiving this revelation is just the first step over Jordan. I'm talking about the revelation that the Lord allowed me to have. It's a real simple revelation. Sometimes the little light bulb will come on in our head, but that's just the beginning. Sometimes the light bulb had not even come on yet. Don't think you automatically understand it. You might. The Holy Spirit will tell you when you understand it. You got to be introduced to it in your in your brain before you can ever allow it to flow down to your heart. But even yet still, you might think that you have a revelation of it. But until we begin, all of us, every last one of us, starting with the preacher to walk in it Amen. and to apply it, we're not really ready yet. See, re receiving the revelation of Jesus Christ and him crucified. What is the revelation of Jesus Christ and him crucified? Listen, this is going to take me a lot of words to say this, but really, it's going to be pretty short. The revelation of Jesus Christ and him crucified is that the first time I was born like this, dude, right? I know I've said it once. Adam. I was born like Adam, born dead and in sin. Sin separating me from the presence of God. My flesh out front. But then somebody told me the good news of the gospel. Told me that Jesus died for me. That he died for my sin. That I could come and sing the song of the redeemed. That I could accept Jesus as my Lord and Savior. And when I did, the Holy Spirit came to live in my heart that day. And now I'm saved. Guess what? That's just the beginning. Mm -hmm. Now the question is, how do I walk with God upon this earth? How do I walk in victory with God upon this earth so that his name could be glorified? So that his work on this earth could be done? So that the things in my life that I've always been in bondage to could be broken and that I could be delivered and that I could truly sing the song of the redeemed because if the Lord would deliver me, I'd be so full of joy, hallelujah, that I'd want to sing the song of the redeemed. If you've ever been set free, listen, I never really did any real time, but I was in a few detention homes and I was in a couple of rehabs, like I told you, and I was locked up. And I can remember on those days that they'd let me out. When I finally got out, I was like, woohoo! Man, the sky is blue. The clouds are fluffy. The sun is shining. Oh, it's so nice out here. Whenever you get set free and delivered from the Lord, from the bondage. Listen to me. Just because you got saved doesn't mean you're free from bondage. Come on, somebody. Help me out here. Amen. Help me out. I'm, I know I'm preaching the truth. Just because you got saved doesn't mean you're free from bondage. I'm talking about crossing the Jordan means you get a revelation. How is it that I walk in this? Every day, Colossians 2, 6 says, the same way you received him, so shall you continue to walk in him. What does that mean? I, you know what the object of your faith is supposed to be? Not your positive confession. Not how much you read. Not how much you go to church. Not what club you're part of. Not what ministry you're involved in. No. Not how loud you sing, how pretty you sing. The, the object of your faith is supposed to be what God has done in providing his son. You know what? You know what God did in providing his son and you putting faith in that? 
The exchange took place. He took your sin. He gave you Jesus' his righteousness. Now when you begin to believe that, because see, the enemy has been lying to people. He's been telling them, oh, you're not free. No, the word of God says you're free. Then you got to start. We have to start to learn to believe God and to receive a revelation that we are free indeed, free in Christ. And when we learn to believe that and walk in that, the Holy Spirit does the work. We're putting the presence of God before us. We're allowing the presence of God to go before us. Adam dies every day, every day. When the enemy tries to come at you and he says, Causes anger to rise up. Listen, I'm talking about, let's get past the addiction stuff, okay? Let's just forget about that right now because we're free. Let's just say we're free. Free indeed. Thank God Almighty I'm free indeed. Amen? So the addiction stuff's gone. Now he's got to deal with Matt's personality. (laughs) That's a problem. Matt's got personality flaws that need to be dealt with. The Holy Spirit wants to produce the, the fruit of love in Matt. The Holy Spirit wants to produce the fruit of long-suffering in Matt. Gentleness, meekness, kindness. The Holy Spirit wants to produce those fruit because they look like Jesus. That's right. Amen. The Holy Spirit wants Jesus to be seen by the world. But until Matt learns how in all of those situations to yield to the will of God, to yield by putting faith in believing See, whenever that person, I know I said it a couple times recently, pokes me in the chest, whatever they did to frustrate you. Do you remember something last week, maybe? Somebody did something to frustrate you? Poked you in the chest, pressed your button. And all of a sudden you feel that thing rise up in you? That's what what I'm talking about. God's wanting to deal with that. And he, he can give you victory over that. Yeah. He wants you to look more like Jesus in that. Oh, I ain't letting nobody walk on me. Okay. Keep on walking out in front, brother. Keep on walking out in front, sister. But whenever you learn to allow the presence of the Lord to walk before you and you learn how to humble yourself, not to, you'll never humble yourself to man till you learn how to humble yourself to God. Hallelujah. When you learn how to humble yourself under the mighty hand of God and in due time, I will exalt you is what the Lord said. When you learn to humble yourself under the mighty hand of God, the Holy Spirit moves in on your behalf. That's what I'm trying to talk about. The Holy Ghost doing a work in your life. He works, though, off of what Jesus did at Calvary. If Jesus doesn't go to the cross, we don't have righteousness from God, and and God can't be near sin, so therefore you and I are left to ourselves. That's the object of your faith daily, whether it's a problem with something that I've always had a problem with, whatever it is, daily I'm learning how to trust and submit myself and yield and say, Lord, this isn't who I am. This person is trying to rise up in me is not who I am. Lord, I need your victory in this area of my life. Lord, the old man died. A new man has been resurrected. Holy Spirit, do the work in me. Thank you, Jesus. You're a new creation in Christ, church. You're a new creation in Christ. And praise God, we need to learn how to walk in that. Amen. There will be many tests and opportunities along the way. I haven't even got to my point yet. Y'all still with me? There will be many tests and opportunities along the way to learn to live the process of the new revelation. New opportunities. Really every day to make the choice to surrender to the will of God. Opportunities to allow the presence of God to go before you and put yourself behind the spirit of God. In other words, take the back seat. Do you think that you have this all figured out this morning? Do you think that it's easy like I got this? Well, my friend, that's where AI comes into the picture. Just as soon as you're so sure you know so much and have this thing licked, bam, Mm. AI. AI sneaks up and it gets you. It happens. AI represents the fact that even though you crossed over, you still have to learn the process of walking like a new man in a new land. And that brings me to point number one. You ready? In the new land, there's a hidden thing. See, even though you cross over Jordan, there's still a hidden thing sometimes. Joshua chapter 7, verse 1. But the children of Israel committed a trespass in the accursed thing. 
For Achan, the son of Carmi, the son of Zabdi, the son of Zerah, of the tribe of Judah, took of the accursed thing, and the anger of the Lord was kindled against the children of Israel. The accursed thing is that tool of the enemy that he uses to cause us to transgress the will of God, whatever it is. His plan is to have something in our lives that stays hidden, that God sees. And through that, I'm talking about the enemy, his plan is to turn God against us. God can't be okay with sin. But you see, God wants to reveal the hidden thing. And many times in my own life, I can remember when I first started preaching the revelation that the Lord had given me. I remember this quote by Brother Raymond Harris, who was the mayor of Franklin. And he was in the first couple of Bible studies that I taught whenever we were at Crossing Place in Franklin. And this is Brother Raymond. This is what he said. This message is like an x-ray into my soul. The message of the truth of Calvary began to cause and to expose on the inside of him things that were hidden. For him, it happened to be false doctrine. Things that were hidden deep down on the inside of him that he was covering and he was protecting and he was wanting to hold on to. Yes. And many times there's things that are hidden deep, deep, deep down inside the recesses of our heart that we're trying to hold on to and protect. Specifically in this story, the Bible says it was a Babylonian garment, like a mantle, like a cloak that you would wear. Now, I'm not trying to get into the false gods of Babylon and how that probably represents something occultic. I don't have time to go there. What I want you to know, though, is that it was like a prophet's garment. See, God, through Elijah, allowed a cloak or a mantle like that to be left for Elisha. In that story, it represents the anointing and the power of God. To perform miracles on earth and to allow God's work to move through us. But in the enemy's hand, a mantle or this hidden thing serves a similar purpose for the enemy to keep us bound under that sin. It's hidden in the ground underneath the tent of Achan. Satan wants to hide that thing deeply in our hearts to where we won't let it out. And he uses it as an idol in our lives that keeps us in a place of failure instead of victory. As long as it remains hidden there. Just because you cross Jordan doesn't mean that you left your flesh. Once again, of the sin nature on the other side, there are things that are in us that God wants out. There are things in us that Satan fights to make us hide. And the failures of the past cannot remain hidden in the heart on the other side of Jordan. Look at Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. What that means is, is that there's been so many believers that have gone before us that have died for the cause of God. Because of that, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us. And let us run with patience the race that is set before us. How? Looking unto Jesus, the author. You know, he started it. He wrote the book and finish of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Amen. Can you imagine trying to run a race with one of the weight vests on? That's what you do for training, right? But, but this, in this story, it's talking about you're trying to run the race for God, but sin, that hidden thing in our lives, keeps weighing us down. Look, look, at, look at 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Listen to me. I want you to understand this. I'm not talking about you broadcasting your sin to the world. That's not what I'm talking about this morning. God doesn't want everybody broadcasting all their sin to the world. What God wants us to do is to come clean with him. That's what the word confess means. It, it's homologia. Hama, H-O-M-O, same, logia, say, in the Greek. Homologia, say the same. God says that something is sin. We're supposed to agree with him that something is sin. Where does he say it's sin? In his word. Through his Holy Spirit, he shows us in his word what sin is. When we've been walking in opposition to the will of God, and we've held on to the hidden thing, whatever it is, I'm not trying to pinpoint a specific thing it could just be a sin in general it's not necessarily what you did last night but it's the thing that kept keeps showing up god wants us to confess that it's a problem in our life to him 
He wants us to let him know, Lord, I want to come clean with you. Lord, I need you to work in my life. Lord, I need you to deliver me from this. Lord, I want this hidden thing gone. You know it's there. I know it's there. I want it to be taken out, Lord. Yes. We got to agree with him, though. And we got to say the same. Sometimes it just starts with a whisper, amen? Yeah. Sometimes just a whisper, Lord, please. Yeah. Please deliver me from this thing. Listen, some people take that scripture where it says confess your faults one to another like, like you're supposed to go tell all your sin to another brother. A lot of times that's connected to how they've treated you. Yeah. And, you're, and you're, you're supposed to go to them and let them know what's, what, how you feel in your heart so that you can rectify that thing between yourselves. Many times you start sharing all your deep, dark secrets with another human being. They, they're not going to treat you right. They're going to broadcast that stuff on the street. You, listen, you don't, if you need somebody to talk to, that's fine. You can come talk to me. But that's not what we teach here. The Lord wants you to understand how to go through Jesus. There's one mediator through man and God. It's the man Christ Jesus. God wants you to go through Jesus. Hallelujah. And to confess your sin to him. To allow that hidden thing in your heart to go to the Lord. So that he can deliver you of it. God through his Holy Spirit shows man where he's wrong. His truth will lead man to give it to God. But as long as it remains hidden in the deep dark recesses of our hearts. It remains a tool of the enemy to steal victory from us. To keep us bound in sin. And as long as we're in that state, we're giving the enemy an open door in our lives. And that brings me to point number two. A door ajar. The word ajar means this. Neither entirely open nor entirely shut. Partly open. The door was ajar. In other words, I got an escape plan. Hmm. If this doesn't work out, I can always do this. Never closed the door completely on the world or, the, or, the, or what it was, whatever that was. But I never completely left it wide open either. I'm kind of like in the fence. I'm kind of like on the fence. I'm kind of like that lukewarm Christian talked about in the book of Revelation. You're neither hot nor cold, so therefore I will spew you out of my mouth. I wish that you were hot or cold. The Lord wants us to make a decision. Amen. It says right here in Joshua chapter 7 verse 5. This is where I'm getting the scripture for the door, the door ajar. The men of Ai smote of them about 30 and 6 men, for they chased them from before the gate even unto Shabaram, and smote them in the going down, wherefore the hearts of the people melted and became as water. Shabaram means breaches, not breaches, breaches. <laughs> An act or result of breaking, a rupture, a violation of a law, a gap made in a wall, a fissure, a crack. The enemy of our soul wants to put a breach in our armor. He wants to move you away from the victory of God and put a hole in the protection that you have in Jesus. Whether he does it through law, whether he does it through psychology, whether he does it through some kind of a medication, whether he does anything that you put before the Lord instead of putting the Holy Spirit in the battle, anything that you allow to get in the way in between allowing the Holy Spirit to bring true victory, anything that allows and protects that hidden thing deep down on the inside of our heart leaves the door ajar mm -hmm. and gives the enemy a foothold to work with. He wants you to be willing to just leave a little crack in the door where sin can creep back in. The sin is compromised away from the known will of God. The whole time God is drawing on our hearts to walk closer with him, to leave this old world behind. Our hearts feel the call. Even though we may be far away, we can still hear a distant whisper. That tells us there's something different. There's hope. There's a new life that awaits, but then the memory comes. And like a wave, it engulfs that whisper of hope. The memory says, don't forget what you have hidden in the ground underneath your tent. And as long as we're willing to live there, we're giving Satan permission to have power in our lives, even though we're on the other side of Jordan. Listen to me, child of God. I don't care what you've done this morning. I don't care how bad it would seem in the eyes of mankind. I'm here to tell you that you're free. I'm here to tell you that if your faith is in Christ and if you've truly repented and you've confessed your sin before the Lord, you are free. And the Lord wants to liberate you and he wants to make that thing. That's all it is, is a bad memory and a bad memory that does not continue to cause you condemnation and guilt. The Lord wants to cause you to rise up. And to be able to walk in victory on the other side of Jordan so that you can bring glory to the Lord. That's God's will. This is point number three, and I'm closing with this point. You ready? 
prostrate in his presence. Look at Joshua chapter 7, verses 6 through 9. It says, and Joshua rent, that means to rip, he ripped his clothes and he fell to the earth upon his face before the ark of the Lord until the evening. He and the elders of Israel and put dust upon their heads and Joshua said, alas, O Lord God, wherefore hast thou at all brought this people over Jordan to deliver us into the hand of the Amorites to destroy us? Wish to God that we had been content and dwelt on the other side of Jordan. Hmm. Oh, Lord, what shall I say when Israel turns their backs before their enemies? For the Canaanites and all the inhabitants of the land shall hear of it and shall surround us and cut off our name from the earth. And what will you do with your great name? And then in verse 13, the Lord says this. Up, sanctify the people and say, sanctify yourselves against tomorrow. For thus says the Lord God of Israel, there is an accursed thing in the midst of thee, O Israel. You cannot stand before your enemies until you take away the accursed thing from among you. Joshua was frustrated and was brought to the prostrate place. On his face before the presence of the Lord. The ark of God. He fell on his face before the presence of the Lord. I want you to, I'm going to share just a couple of things with you real quick. You ready? Number one. In order to see what God wants us to see, there, we will have to experience true repentance. I want to say that again. Because I can't make it happen. You can't lather it up and make it happen. In order to see. Do you want to see what God wants you to see this morning? Do you, do you want to see what God wants you to see about your own heart and about your own walk this morning? Because in order to see what God wants us to see, there will have to, we will have to experience true repentance. Look at verse 6 again. He rent his clothes. He fell to the earth upon his face before the ark of the Lord until the evening. He and the elders of Israel, and they put dust upon their heads. I got to tell you this. Repentance isn't just saying that you're sorry. Oh, boy. Repentance also includes being sorrowful. There will be some deep feelings of emotion stirred when there's true repentance. Falling on the face, tearing of the clothes, dust on the head. All this represents mourning over sin. But don't mistake emotions for repentance either. Look at Joel chapter 2 verse 13. This is what the prophet Joel said to the children of Israel. Rend your heart and not your garments. Turn unto the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and of great kindness, and he repents of the evil. In other words, when the Lord sees sin in our lives, he has a plan to judge sin. But when we truly repent, rip your heart, not just your clothes. I've seen people cry, and Lord knows I've done it before. Cry before the Lord, get all emotional, and mean, you know, kind of mean it. But then at the same time, I never rip my heart. The Lord wants us to rip our heart before Him. Amen? Rip, you rip your heart, and then guess what the Lord will do? He's kind, and He's slow to anger. You know what He'll do? He'll repent. See, people say, God never changes my Well, hold on. <coughs> God plans to judge sin. And when He sees the broken and the contrite heart that puts their faith in Christ, amen, He will change His mind from bringing judgment upon that soul and instead placing grace and mercy up in, the, in, in, that, in that place. Amen. Point number two, in order to see what God wants us to see, we will have to get prostrate in His presence. I thought this was good. He fell to the earth. That word fell in the Hebrew literally means to cease or to die. Dude, this is an easy thing to say, but it's not an easy thing to live. To cease or to die. I'm talking about your flesh. I'm talking about my flesh. Amen? I'm talking about surrendering to the will of God. How many times do we think that we've done what we're supposed to do, yet at the same time we realize that thing still wants to live, that thing still wants to come up. Lord, help us. Help us. We're going to have to fall to the ground and lay prostrate and get into the presence of the Lord as we yield to the will of God. The last thing, the end result is this, Joshua 7, 13, sanctify yourself. See, true repentance results in us moving away from the hidden thing. You can't stay right there. You can't stay there and party with the hidden thing. The child of God has to remove itself from the hidden thing. 
There's not a better place, I'm closing with this, than to be prostrate in the presence of God. We like to think that we live in that humble place. I'm not picking on anybody. I'm talking to Matt. Hmm. We like to think that we live in that humble place. But sadly, it more often requires challenge and trials that frustrate us and remind us of how weak we are, really, outside the help of God. That's right. To come to the place where we'll truly cry out to the Lord. Yes. Amen? Amen.